Am I on? Yeah. Yep. Right, I'm going to start with talking about a testimony. Yeah. And it's a testimony by an African man, James Kowalia. And the reason I'm starting with this testimony is because I think it shows the importance and the effectiveness of um, intercession and prayer. Now, this man, James Kowalia, on the day of his birth, he was married to a 60-year-old witch on the day of his birth. And all the formative years of his life were spent going deeper and deeper into the occult. Um, his testimony shocked me, to be quite honest. It shocked me and it alarmed me at the level of dedication, the level of organisation, the level of focus and the level of determination the occult has to bring us down. Um, all of their evil practices were carried out as if their lives depended on it. And they did. Because if they didn't hit their target, Christians, then those evil deeds, those curses, those spells, would land on them and the ones they loved. So their lives were continually hanging in the balance. And they were driven by fear, intimidation, and horror. So, yeah, so the targets were always Christians, and the focus was to stop prayer, to break up the intercession. If a pastor gained authority in the spirit, gained authority in the spirit, the occult could feel it as vibrations. They could actually feel it. No matter what they were doing, whether they're praying or going about their everyday life, they could feel the vibrations from the authority of a Christian. Um, and at one point he describes one situation in Africa where a pastor was coming to preach. They had to move 70 miles away to be safe. 70 miles away not to be affected by this pastor's preaching. And the pastor himself wasn't even aware of the authority he had. The demons told James, this James that the pastor's authority in the spirit had to be broken. But they couldn't do this by physical attack. They couldn't go up and attack him, they couldn't firebomb the church, they couldn't firebomb where he was preaching, because it would result in their death. And what was not explained to the, this occult at the time was that God would not allow a physical attack. He would take their life if they, if they tried to take theirs. So what followed next was how he takes down pastors and churches. And what they do is they break up the, uh, the intercession individually and collectively. That's the stop the prayer. We do not realize the authority we've been given in prayer. Now, the second time he talked about a pastor and having to break up the prayer, they did the same, they went to the intercessors. Now this church they went to was on a 90 day long prayer, six hours a day, and it was prayers of thanksgiving and worship, um, prayers of repentance, and prayers of spiritual warfare. The demons told them that if they completed this 90 days of prayer, six hours a day, no demonic activity would be able to operate in that country for 70 years. That is how powerful the intercession this church was doing. No demonic activity would be able to operate in the whole country for 70 years. So these witches and warlocks approached this church, but they approached as godly people. They approached as sheep in wolf, wolf's clothing. So the first day they approached the church was one woman, a witch, and they got 22 days left of prayer. And as she approached the church, the pastor came out of the church and she started talking to the pastor. And she'd been talking to the pastor for a while and then another woman came out of the church. And as soon as this witch clapped eyes on the woman, she just pointed at her and insulted her. The moment she insulted her, she came out of the spirit and into the flesh. 
So what happened there was how they interrupted the prayer, getting them out of the spirit into the flesh. And they succeeded in bringing this church down. On the second to last day, they broke it all up. They found a nick in the shaft of one person. And it was bitterness and unforgiveness. That was all it took for the occult to get a handle, to get a foothold. Bitterness and unforgiveness. Before they even turned up at the church, they were, they were cursing and casting spells day after day and thousands a day. Thousands a day. Um, yeah, and before they turned up at the church, Satan himself gave them books on each member of the church. And it was all their experience of sin, the sins they had committed through the whole life, the sins that they had committed, the sins that had been committed against them. And they were to read these books to find out what sins they were susceptible to. And then he gave them additional books on the family and on the family tree. So even people that weren't alive anymore and they were to read through the generational lines of these people for each person and find out which sins kept repeating through the generational lines and into that person to find out how they could get them to sin. So, yep, where am I here? Yep, so as this woman came out of the church and the witch was pointed and cursed at her. Um, she came out of the spirit into the flesh. And as James Coelho puts it, the moment she came into the flesh, all the curses and spells could then land and they had an effect. This was the woman who had the bitterness and unforgiveness and it was against a mother. And all it took was one insult, one insult. You know, when Christians are together in unity, in prayer, obviously in Christ, it can't be stopped unless they themselves get in the way. But as this went on, the occult ended up having more and more influence in this church. More and more of them infiltrated the church. And on the second to last day, they'd fallen out to the point where they wouldn't carry on. And what's just as surprising is if they'd have repented on the second to last day and carried on and finished the final day, it would have counted. It would have worked. The Lord would have honored it. So we've got to recognize and believe the power of prayer and the power of intercession because our enemy that's what they aim to stop. That's what they go for. You know, Bobby Connor describes prayer as an audience with the king. We've, we've got to believe that. We've got to really believe that when we're, when we're praying, we're in front of God. He's listening. And especially when we're intercessing. Because God listens to the prayers of intercession. All right? And... We've got to become prayer warriors. We've got to take this seriously. Our enemy knows everything about us. He knows all our sins. He knows the sins we repeat. He knows the sins of our family. He knows what makes us react. He knows what insults us. But he can't create anything. He needs to use those in the world to create what he wants he's smarter than us we, we can't out argue satan he's far wiser and far smarter than we are so what do we do we need to beat the world in here before we beat it out there he's cunning he is very very cunning if you look at the first sin in the garden of eden in genesis 3 the serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, 
Did God really say you must not eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Note that the serpent, Satan, gets Eve on her own. Then he says a lie, but it sounds like there's truth in it. You know, did God really say you must not eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden? That's a lie, he didn't say that. But it sounds like there's truth in it. It's cunning. And also, perhaps trying to plant a bit of doubt in the mind as well. Did God really say? So verse 2. Of course you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, there's, there's two angles that struck me here. Well, first of all, Satan lies again. You will not surely die. You know, but there's two angles that struck me here. And don't think for a moment I'm trying to excuse this sin. I am not. They were told not to do one thing, and they did it. So, the best way I can explain it is, you know when children are really little, and they're innocent, um, and the toddlers, um, who do they want to be like? They want to be like the mum and the dad. They want to be like the parents. So where Eve hears, you'll be like your father. You eat that fruit, you'll be like your father. How cunning is that lie? If that's the way it happened, but how cunning is that? The other angle to look at it, at it is, she could also be coveting God's knowledge and wisdom. So, yeah. So then what did they do after they sinned? Um, they hid, they hid from God. They put the distance between them and God. That's what sin does. It puts a distance between us and God. We can't afford to have a worldly point of view because it's so heavily contaminated by Satan. In Matthew 16, verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. So Peter is acting in the flesh. That's why Jesus says you're a dangerous trap to me. Because it's not coming from God, it's coming from flesh. It's, his emotions have bubbled over. He's now not listened to a word Jesus has said, and he's now arguing with that word. His emotions have just bubbled over, and he's acting in the flesh. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. And in verse 19 it says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immoral immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarrelling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. In James's testimony, the church member who was insulted was angry, and then that was the start of division. We need to be asking God to show us if there's any unforgiveness, any bitterness, and any wounds in us that will give the devil a, a, a handle, a foothold in our lives. In order to be effective intercessors then, we need to be cleansing ourselves daily. We need to be being led by the Holy Spirit so we don't, know, so we don't follow the desires of a sinful nature. Um, and we need the vigilance to guard our minds. Because when God forgives sins, they're gone, they're done, they're forgiven. There's, there's not even a record in heaven of them. They're gone, they're erased. But the world remembers them. Satan remembers them. In fact, they keep a list. The world and Satan keep a list. 
So, the world now is so polluted by Satan, it's incredibly heavily influenced by him. I mean, if, just if you look at music, movies, TV shows, gossip, covetousness, and the lewd clothing that is now worn, it's, it's obscene, the clothing now. Um, that is, is just, you, you just don't know where to look. It's, it's ridiculous. You don't need to see people naked. They, they might as well be naked stood in front of you. So, Matthew 5, verse 28 says, But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery. Has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So, we've already committed a sin in our minds. That means the imagination is real. That means it counts. It counts what goes through here. You can't be, you'll not be excused that. We need, we need to make sure we're beating the world in here. So, then verses 29 and 30 say, So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. This is basically saying remove the things from your life that cause you to sin. So if, you, if your sin is drunkenness, get all the alcohol out of your house. Don't go to the pub. If your sin is pornography, get rid of your computer. Get rid of your smartphone. You know, cut it off. You know, with regard to what's in your mind is real and it counts. It's possible to, you can hate someone and that person not be aware of it. Do you think that counts? Of course it does, yeah. So, I'm going to move on to Matthew 6 verses 22 and 23. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your whole body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. How deep that darkness is. Now the word eye in these two verses is ophthalmus, which means the eye of your mind. It's your imagination. And look at the, the warning Jesus is giving us here about the eyes of your mind and your imagination. How deep that darkness is. In other words, the depth of that darkness is far greater than we realise. So we need to take our mind's eye, our imagination, very, very seriously because it counts. Our enemy doesn't like prayer because it's a major part of relationship with the Lord. If you look at Daniel, what an intercessor that man was. What an, an amazing man of God Daniel was. Prayed three times a day. And what did those in the world do? Those with selfish ambition. They conspired against him to change the law. To use his prayers as a way to villainise him. For their selfish ambition. Does that sound familiar when we look at the world today? We can no longer talk about Christ in hospitals, in places of work, in schools. They've changed the law, so we can't. There's one, there's a church that I know about, that's not a million miles away from here, that opened up a youth club. And to all kids but in order to do this they had to get permission from the council and they got permission from the council but 
they had to remove all literature about Christ, even off the walls. And what's worse was they did it. They did it. I'm going to look at a couple of intercessors in the Bible now. And it's the heart of them that stands out to me. It's the boldness, the humility, the fact God always comes first with them and they love their neighbour. They're not looking for self-promotion and their desire of their heart is to see people saved from the path of destruction that they're on. So, I'm going to go to Abraham when the Lord told him he was going, down, going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Now Abraham is not arguing with God's judgment, but is concerned for any righteous people living there. Anyone that would perish that doesn't deserve it. His heart is to see them saved. He's appealing to God for their well-being that they will not get swept along with the unrighteous. So this is Genesis 18 in verse 25. Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why, you will be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the world do what is right? Now that's an incredibly bold thing to say to God, isn't it? I don't think I, I'd, I'd say that, but look at, look at his heart. His heart is for people to be saved. And in the upcoming verses, we see he says it with humility and a recognition that he is dust and ashes, that he's nothing. So in verse 26, he goes on. And the Lord replied, If I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. And Abraham spoke again, Since I have begun, let me speak further to my Lord. Even though I am but dust and ashes, suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord. Abraham pleaded, let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. Then Abraham replied, since I've dared to speak to the Lord, you can tell he feels like he's pushing it now. <laughs> Since I've dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are only 20. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Suppose there are only 10. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Abraham is realising just what an evil place Sodom and Gomorrah have become because it's reducing the amount of righteous people. Doesn't that sound like the same realisation we've all been coming to for the last 20 years? Yeah. That there's been that much corruption unveiled in these last couple of decades that it takes some believing at first. Money, power, mixed with selfish ambition and lust of the flesh, They've just taken a real grip on those that have power in this world. We've got to be praying for our government. We've got to be interceding for them. We've got to be praying for repentance. So this, this is kind of, a, I found this is like a call to prayer, to be praying for cities, to be praying for nations. You know, God chose Abraham because he would direct his offspring to keep the way of the Lord and to do what is right and just. He says God singled him out. Our calling is the same. We've been singled out. In Isaiah 43, it says, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. 
our offspring is spiritual and it, I believe it starts with intercession so the other intercessor I'm going to talk about is Moses a truly remarkable intercessor 40 years of intercessing this man astonishes me he astounds me his heart is incredible I've got two examples here but his desire to see people saved and to protect them is it just blows me away so in Exodus 32 verse 7 the Lord told Moses quick go down the mountain your people who you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves how quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live they have melted down gold and made a calf and they have bowed down in sacrifice to it they are saying these are your gods O Israel who brought you out of the land of Egypt then the Lord said I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them then I will make you Moses into a, a great nation so he's telling Moses here I'm gonna lift you up you're, you're gonna have glory and what did Moses do but Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God oh Lord he said why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and a strong hand why let the Egyptians say there God rescued them with evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them out from the face of the earth turn away from your fierce anger change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people remember your servants Abraham Isaac and Jacob you bound yourself with an oath to them saying I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and I will give them all this land that I have promised to your descendants and they will possess it forever so the Lord changed his mind the Lord changed his mind about the ter terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people he changed his mind because Moses interceded for them no that firstly Moses was concerned for God and how he would be perceived by his enemies um, his first concern was God his secondly Moses recalled the words of God um, yeah and thirdly he wasn't persuaded in any way shape or form by his own promotion from God wasn't bothered never gave it a second thought please don't do this to them Lord leave them please so the next um, I want to talk about another situation with Moses and um, yeah this is incredible um, it's from Numbers 16 and it's when a rebellion comes against Moses and Aaron by the leaders of the tribes of Israel they're wanting a more of an egalitarian approach arguing that Moses and Aaron basically shouldn't be in charge with everything that goes on so Moses said this is how you know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things that I have done for I have not done them on my own if these men die a natural death or if nothing unusual happens <laughs> then the Lord has not sent me but if the Lord does something entirely new and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them all and all their belongings and they go down alive into the grave you will know that these men have shown contempt for the Lord and I don't know about you but on hearing that at that point I'll be going all right I'm sorry <laughs> you're, you're in charge I'll, yeah I'll accept that but they didn't so in verse 32 of number 16 the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the men along with their households and all their followers who were standing by them and everything they owned and it gets worse the following day 
The next day the Israelites complained to Moses that he killed all the Lord's people. I just stand here in disbelief. I read this and I'm just in disbelief. I can just imagine Moses stood there looking at him just thinking, are you serious? Are you serious? How many times do you have to see? How many times do you have to be told? You know, what's wrong with you? You've just seen the ground open up. What's wrong with you? So, as this happens, as they're accusing Moses, the Lord's presence, a cloud, descends onto the tabernacle. It says in verse 42, the glorious presence of the Lord appeared. Moses and Aaron came and stood in front of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, get away from these people so that I can instantly destroy them. But Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground. And Moses said to Aaron, quick, take an incense burner and place burning coals on it from the altar, lay incense on it, and carry it out among the people to purify them and make them right with the Lord. The Lord's anger is blazing against them. The plague has already begun. So they're dying at this point, the Israelites. So Aaron does exactly as Moses has told him to do, he goes dashing out with the incense burner, covering them with the smoke, and it saved them. Now the boldness of Moses here, of God saying, right, now I'm having him, now I'm destroying him. The boldness to step in front of God here and say, no, we can save some of these. That's incredible. That is incredible. You know, to directly intervene. And what blows me away with Moses is the long suffering of Moses, the patience, the desire to see people saved, even though they openly worked against him the mercy the kindness the patience and the love he operated in was just just i just find it incredible absolutely incredible so from moses we can see that god listens to those that intercede for others god changed his mind that's yeah god, god changed his mind that's the regard god has for those that intercede Right, referring back to James Koalia's testimony, the occult aim is to stop prayer and intercession, both individually and collectively. And he gives an example of one pastor they were trying to stop. So what they did was they cursed his daughter with eczema so she couldn't sleep, which in turn meant he couldn't sleep. So then that affected his morning prayer. And night after night of being kept in awake his prayer just went out the window they succeeded they stopped him praying so i'm going to look at um, another example of prayer prayer but this time commu communal prayer i'm going to look at jonah firstly individually when god told him to go east to nineveh he set off and then when he was on his way he thought nah no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going there they, they were fierce and they were, they were brutal he, he was scared um, but you know when we choose to go the opposite way to good sooner or later the storm will come and when the storm comes we're at the mercy of the world and that's not somewhere you want to be you don't want to be relying on the mercy of the world and that's when we cry out to the mercy of God so as we know, when he gets out of the whale, he goes to Nineveh, he delivers his message. And in unity, they prayed, fasted, and repented. Even the animals fasted. God spared them. God spared them. They were going, he was going to destroy the lot of them. So another excellent example of unity is the Spartans. I know Andy's mentioned this before. Do you know the shields, they were actually tied to their arms. They couldn't, they couldn't let go of them, they couldn't put them down, the shields 
were tied to their arms. And what they'd do is they'd protect their left side and the right side of the man stood to their left. And they trusted the man stood to their right to, project, to protect this half of them. So what strikes me about the, the Spartans and everybody is it's the unity they had. They were vigilant for each other because they were defending them. They grew together, they trained together, they fought together, they attacked together, they defended together, they were united in their ideas, they were united in their plan, and they considered dying for their cause the greatest honour. And they weren't Christian. But they went down in history because of the unity. That was the strength, the unity. So I'm going to read a couple of verses from the Bible now <coughs> and see if you know which people this is describing. All right. Behold, the people is one and they have all one language and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Uh, I didn't honestly think you would, you a lot wouldn't know, to be quite honest. <laughs> the tower, it's the Tower of Babel. And these are not godly people. But because of their unity, God had to step in and, and confound the language, confuse the language. Note the imagined to do part. And now nothing they will be, will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. It's the power of imagination again. Imaginations in unity. There's, if, do you know, if you look at the Lord's Prayer, it's forgive us our trespasses, give us our daily bread. It's all us. It's not praying for yourself. There's only one I in it. And that is I forgive. Everything else is giving God the glory, praying for everyone, and saying I forgive. So, looking at the prayers in the heart of Moses, how he repeatedly prayed, intercessed for the, for the Israelites. Our responsibility is to protect each other. And it's a responsibility. You are responsible for praying for everybody else. It is a responsibility. We need to really lock shields. We need to learn together, we need to fight together, we need to train together, we need to defend together. We need to be an army with Christ behind us. We need to pray that there's enough labourers to bring in the harvest. Because if there isn't, there's going to be people that don't hear the word, that don't get saved. We need to pray there's going to be enough labourers to bring in the harvest. There's one thing that struck me whilst I was writing this as well, is that when we talk about our enemy, we think Satan. Yes, it is, yeah. But there's two. The other enemy is sin. And there's two types of sin. There's the sin you do without realising, and the sins we know we're going to do, and then we do anyway very different the sin you know you're going to do and then you know and then you do anyway that's really bad and it can be something little you know when you, you go and get a cup of coffee or you go to a fast food joint 
and you go to get your sugar or your, your ketchup or your brown sauce, whatever it is, you take an handful or take some for later or when you get back. Well, that's not, they're not there for that. You're stealing. They're there for your meal that you bought. And we explain it away by saying, yeah, but I'm not merging anybody. You know, it's just a few packets. Well, sin is sin. Sin is sin. No matter how big or small we rate it, sin is sin. And in order to be effective intercessors, we've got to address everything in our lives. We've got to lead full on godly lives. We've got to walk in the fullness that Christ has given us. And all these little things that we do that we, we explain away, I'm not committing murder, what's the problem with that? Well, yeah, it does count. Like what you think about counts. So if we'll turn from sin, the ones we know we're committing, if we will pray daily and intercede daily, if we read the word and take every word of it into our hearts and we guard our minds daily, we'll be on our way to being without spot or wrinkle. We'll be on the right path. I'm just going to finish with a scripture from 2 Chronicles. Verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, which means to fast, and pray and seek my face, imagination, the eyes of the mind, and turn from their wicked ways, obviously sin, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Yeah. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hand over to Andrew. Thanks, Steve. Can you imagine when you listen to what Steve was saying about the Spartans or, you know, the Anglo-Saxons when they, you know, did some of the most fierce fighting? And, uh, but can you imagine what the Joel army is going to be like? The Joel 2. It says in the word that there'll be none like this again. They will fall upon swords and not be killed. Listen, there's a higher way. There's a, there's a higher way the Lord is calling us today. And my call is this, lock shields. Let's lock shields together. And everything, because Satan is going to come, he is coming against us. You know, when Alex and Troy and Robin and Tyler were here with us the last time and they left, everyone got sick. Well, me and Heidi and I know Troy and... <coughs> We all got sick. Why? To kill this message. To kill, to cut off, to destroy. <coughs> See, I'm still recovering. To kill and destroy the message that God has put in these places. So we need to lock shields together. We need to intercede with each other, with each other, together, as well as for each other. You know, I love, you know, our friends in Boise. Yeah, you know, they meet sometimes four to five times a week. Three of them are with prayer. Ladies interceding. And they pray for us, thank God. Why aren't we doing the same? Why aren't we, honestly, why aren't we doing the same? I'm not telling you off, I'm just, yeah, why aren't we doing the same? But if you want to read one for me, I mean, I love what Steve said, because I was looking at this as Steve was saying it, Daniel. If you look at Daniel 9 and the intercession that Daniel did before God, look what it says. Oh, Daniel, I have come forth, because it, it, he's, he's interceding in the first part of Daniel 9. And in verse 21, yet while I was speaking... So he's still praying. This is Daniel, 
praying and interceding for what God is wanting to do. He says, while I was still be speaking, the man, Gabriel, came to me. Why isn't Gabriel turning up in our prayer meetings? Seriously. That's just a, you know, rhetorical question. Who I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Oh, Daniel, I have come to give you understanding. Lord, just give us understanding. And then Daniel, we know the story of Daniel 11, when Daniel is praying and fasting again. And look what Michael says, uh, sorry, look what um, uh, Gabriel says to him again. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day, don't forget, 21 days has gone by, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. By who? Not Gabriel, by God. So everything that Steve was saying was absolutely bang on. God hears our prayer and our crying and our supplications and, and everything that we, he's hearing us. And I love this. And to humble yourself before your God, your words were here, and I came because of your words. How much more are we going to need this as we see the days approaching for this land, because Jesus says, if these days weren't cut short, even the very elect wouldn't survive. They are going to be fierce days. So my cry is this, let's start meeting together and praying and interceding for our country, for what God has put into our places here in Bushfire and certainly across in Boise and Idaho, for the bride to arise and shine to start coming forward. And we are not going to be able to do this without prayer and intercession. My wife, for me, I'm, I'm lucky. My wife is an interceder. She prays a lot. And I love it. You know, me, not so much. I mean, I'll pray and I love prayer. But I, I'm, I'm one of these guys, I just want to lock myself away and pray. I just love being that, having that intimacy with the Lord, just praying in a, in a shut-off room just between me and the Lord where I can just be myself. And I love that. But folks, we're going to need each other. We're going to need, and this is my cry to you, we need to start locking shields. We need to start locking shields together, covering each other, covering each other in prayer because of what's coming. You don't think this is going to be trying, that Satan hasn't been trying to destroy this place? with his minions just, you know, over the hill there, with the witches and the warlocks, and you don't think that hasn't come against us? It comes across us daily. Every time we have put people up here in a certain place, things start happening. We never tell anybody this is where they're staying, this is what we're going to do. You know, Neville, Paul Keith, you know, Robin and Troy and Alex and everyone, you know, things start happening. Why? Because we're ruffling feathers. We're coming together. We're ruffling. They feel our presence. We don't have to say, here's my calling card. They know that we're here. So folks, my prayer is this, lock shields. It can't be, you know, and I know it isn't, I'm not telling you off because I know that you are faithful, but please pray for us. Please pray. I know you do, and I know you, but please pray because the message that we carry here you know, is going out, is going out to all around the world. I mean, you just look at some of the comments that I follow every time we stream or Zoom. The message is going out to a hungry group of people, and thank God, thank you, because people are getting up at stupid hour to come and join us so they don't miss it. They're getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to, to follow us. Bless them to follow what we're doing here because there is a remnant out there called the bride that is going to shine. It's going to start getting themselves without spot or wrinkle. Don't we want that? Don't you want a renewed body? I certainly do. 
Because, folks, when we climb into the windows and climb the walls and we're marching in unison and we're, we're not joint and pushing each other out the way, we're one band, one army, and the Lord's voice will thunder before this mighty army. There will not be one feeble, not one ill, not one sick. So when Steve says, start using your imagination, contemplate, imagine yourself in that army in Joel 2 and what the Lord requires of you. Because listen, folks, if you do not do what the Lord is requiring of you today, for tomorrow, and these years that are coming upon us, guess what? He'll find somebody else. He'll find somebody else. Remember? Matthew 22, verse 5, they went about their own business. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I just, no, that's not my remit. That's not what the Lord told me to do. Well, are you sure? <laughs> if I had a pound for every time somebody said that to me and I know it wasn't the Lord, I'd be a very rich man. But I can't say anything. But anyway, that was a good preach. Thank you, Steve. Really good. <clears throat> it was encouraging. You know, so I'm going to pray. All right, just let's stand up, please, because we're going to lock shields together. And for all those folk that are out there, thank you for our friends um, out in America. And, you know, I, I know I can't name you all. And here in the UK are some of you from London and all around. But we want to thank you for joining us today. But could you, wherever you are watching this, um, just stand and, and join with us in prayer. And my prayer is this, that God is going to get sons and his son is going to get a bride. And therefore, Father, we give ourselves to this thing. We give ourselves to this. But Lord, just like Daniel, will you give us understanding and wisdom to know what we ought to do? Lord, will you teach us a new way of how to pray. Because Lord, as it says in Revelation 14, this company of the bride, the friends of the bridegroom, is going to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They learn a new song in heaven. They're given a new name. And Lord, I pray now for each and every person that is here in this place and watching, streaming, Zooming. Lord, come and touch us. Come and send your messengers to us to open up our eyes to the vision that you have for us and set before us. And Lord, let us not hold on to anything tightly apart from you. Lord, we want to lay down our aspirations. We want to lay down everything that we have planned. Lord, we lay it down. And we ask you now, Lord, to place us where you want us to be to do what you would have us do for this time. And Lord, I'll protect our friends in Boise, Idaho, and in Texas, where this message is getting out to all folk out there. Protect them, Lord, and we stand with them in it. We stand here in Sheffield, United Kingdom. We stand with our brothers and sisters, wherever you are, in Israel, we stand with you. I know this faithful person who streams from Israel and even watched it whilst the alarms were going off and they were in their bomb shelters. May the Lord shine upon you. May he bless you and your household wherever you are and bless us in this place. But Lord, I pray now, let us start ruffling some feathers in this whole area of intercession and prayer. Will you lead us in it, Lord? Will you come and teach us a new way of how to pray? And Lord, let there not be anything in our hearts of unforgiveness to any brethren, to any thing of the past. I pray, Lord, just we want to be released from that. We want to forgive where we need to forgive. Let there be nothing in us that when the devil comes to us, he'll find nothing in us that agrees with him. That, Lord, I pray now, give us that time over these next few days and weeks, Lord, where we will, you will remind us what we need to do. 
So the devil has nothing in us. So Lord, protect our families, protect our children and our grandchildren. Protect our households. And Holy Spirit, we want to be led by you. We want to become the masculine, the ones that are wise out of Daniel. So we have understanding of the day that we are living in. I pray for that right now, Lord. Give us understanding on that Tuesday night where there's just a little huddle of folk on the Bible study in Daniel. Give us understanding, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place and in other places around the world. You are stirring a body of people called the Friends of the Bridegroom. You are stirring us into action. But Lord, let us be united. Let us lock shields. Let us intercede and pray for one another. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Um, I just want to make sure, folks, I don't want to move on too quickly, but, you know, there's some sort of thing. Next week, this place will not be open here in Bushfire. As I say, that because most of us are away um, in Scotland. And, um, we, but there will be a service of some sort. We will we'll pre-record things. We'll put it up and then do it and launch it uh, at 10.30 next Sunday. So there will be something happening, but it just won't be here. So uh, I hope so. <laughs> better put a thing on the door before we leave. There won't be a service here. We'll put it on the WhatsApp group and get it out there. Um, but please pray for us when we go to Scotland that we meet the Lord. That's all we want to do is meet the Lord. And we pray that uh, Camilla and Jojo get released from work to come and join with us in that week because it will be special. But thank you for listening. Heidi, is there anything you want to add? We've got Bible study this Tuesday and then pre-meeting, prayer meeting on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. You know, be there or be square. And, uh, oh, and the lady. So there's a ladies prayer meeting uh, that they do gather together. I know they do uh, on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, you know who you are. Try and be there. That'd be great. But God bless you. And we say goodbye to our streamers. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for, for getting up early. Thank you for listening. And those people that are listening after today, 